here are those same two molecules but labeled in a much different way. The R and the S here are a lot like the E and the Z that we saw when we were talking about another way to name cis-trans isomers with alkenes. In fact, the same people that came up with the E and the Z also did the R and the S. And these are the last names of three different scientists, chemists, who came up with this, Con Engel Prelog. And you can see that the enantiomer that's on the left side, uh, as it was on the previous slide, is labeled with a capital S, and the other one is R. And it turns out that there is a way for us to designate any pair of enantiomers, one being R and the other being S, if we know what to look for. And it has to do with ranking the substituents on the carbon, one through four, and then noticing their relative positions. It says here, you can look on page 286 to get some examples of this. But the way we've labeled this one on the left uh, is by atomic number of what's directly connected to the chiral carbon. Remember, it was atomic number we used when we were talking E and Z. And so the oxygen in the OH group outranks the carbon that's part of the ethyl group, which outranks the carbon that's part of the methyl group. And all three of those outrank the hydrogen. And so what we do is draw the enantiomers so that that fourth ranking substituent is the one that's receding away from us, in this case hydrogen. And with chiral compounds, it's oftentimes a hydrogen that is that fourth ranker. Uh, and when I look at the other three substituents going one, two, three, this big red looping arrow is showing that we go in a counterclockwise fashion to go from one to two to three. Whereas it's enantiomer, it'll necessarily be true that when we go from 1 to 2 to 3, labeling the same substituents in the same way, but now we're going clockwise. And so that S is associated with that counterclockwise rotation and the R with the clockwise. Doing this doesn't tell us anything at all about which one is going to rotate plane polarized light in a particular direction. We know how to match these up because these are well-studied molecules. But this does allow me, if I know these rules, to be able to take the names and draw one particular enantiomer versus the other. And a lot of the exercises, uh, the worksheets in this chapter, have to do with recognizing enantiomers and being able to assign either an R or an S to them. The R, by the way, comes from the Latin word rectus meaning right and the S comes from the Latin word sinister which means left. Nowadays sinister means evil but uh, in the old days it simply meant left and so S and R means left and right based on these arrows that we've drawn because in principle any chiral compound because it has four different substituents on the carbon that means we have to be able to rank the substituents one through four based on atomic number and so there would always be this oppositeness one enantiomer is R the other has to be S. Here are some other ways of representing differences in chirality. Uh, ball and stick models do a good job of that and if we know the identity of those atoms we could rank those R or S. Wedges and dashes do something similar as before dashes are going away from us, wedges are coming out towards us, and so that's yet another way to distinguish the chiral isomers of bromochlorofluoromethane that we see here. And notice one is labeled R, the other S. Uh, a simpler to draw uh, structural formula that is dating back a uh, hundred years now are these things called Fisher projections. So we had seen things like Newman projections in Chapter 3. Now we've got another two-dimensional picture that can be interpreted as being a three-dimensional object. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how Fisher projections work, and we'll see some of those show up among the exercises as well.